Hi everyone, uh, we're glad you're able to join us today. Hope you all had a good week. Um, just wanna say thank you for all the encouraging feedback we've gotten regarding the online services so far. Obviously not the ideal scenario, uh, but I'm glad that our church is able to uh, continue to meet in this way. Before we begin our service, uh, I just wanna take a moment. Um, so this week we mourn the loss of our dear brother, Mark Plude. Uh, if you've met him, you know what a blessing he was. And so we pray for comfort and peace uh, for Lori and the rest of the family. Uh, when we think of Easter, we often talk about victory over death. And I love what Lori wrote in her update. She wrote, He, Mark, walked alongside us as we face death in the face, knowing that Christ's death on the cross gave Mark victory over death, and he is now pain-free and in heaven. Such true words, um, and as we sing this morning about our risen King, what an encouragement to know uh, that Mark is right there with Jesus today. 1 Corinthians 15 says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is a sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's worship our God together.
Let's pray. But before we begin praying, I want to encourage you to get up from where you're sitting, find a place, and kneel down. This is not for God's benefit, but for ours. God does not need us to kneel, and God does not hear our prayer any better if we kneel. But we need to be reminded that our loving Heavenly Father is also Almighty God, and our brother Jesus is our King, enthroned in heaven above. So let's kneel if you can get down and back without commotion, and let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you alone are perfect in every way. Holy, holy, holy. You alone are our King, and our desire is for your will to rule our lives. You alone are eternal. You alone are perfect in wisdom and we praise you for being God, our Father. We know that you take no delight in suffering, and when Jesus walked on the earth, serving, 
Everywhere he went, he healed sickness, because he had compassion on those who suffer, and as a sign of your power and his authority over evil. We see today in a new way that we are weak and not in control of our lives. If you turn your face away and remove your hand of blessing and protection, we are in deep trouble. All the peoples of the earth are in your hand. You rule the nations and desire to make yourself known. You have done in a short time to China and Europe and the United States what no power on earth could do to stop us all in our tracks, and you alone can deliver us from this evil. Lord, I pray that no one in our congregation will die from this virus, and that you will bring glory to yourself by doing this miracle. And now let's pray in the words of the psalmist in Psalm 71. Lord, you are our refuge. Don't let us down. Rescue us. Bend down your ear and listen to our plea and save us. O oh God, don't stay away. Come quickly. Help. We will keep on expecting you to help us. Be to us a great protecting rock, where we are always welcome, safe from all attacks. O oh Lord, you alone are our hope. You have helped us constantly. No wonder we are always praising you. We praise you more and more. For you have issued the order to save us. Our success, at which so many stand amazed, is because you are our mighty protector. All day long we will praise and honor you for all that you have done for us. We cannot count the times you have faithfully rescued us from danger. We will tell everyone of your constant daily care. We walk in the strength of the Lord. You have done such wonderful things. We will praise you with singing, telling of your faithfulness to all your promises. O Holy One of Israel, we will shout and sing your praises for redeeming us. We tell everyone that you alone are just and good. Your power and goodness, Lord, reach to the highest heavens. Lord, comfort those who have recently lost loved ones and heal and relieve the suffering from those who are gravely ill. We pray those needing surgery and medical help will get the help they need soon. And we pray that those who are trying to adopt children will be able to adopt a child soon. And we pray as Moses did, giving his final blessing to the people of Israel, there is none like God who rides through the heavens to your help and in his majesty through the skies. The eternal God is your dwelling place and underneath are his everlasting arms. We pray all this in Jesus' name, and we thank you for answering our prayer. Amen. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Welcome to our Sunday service. I'm glad you can be with us. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Romans. We're going to look at just one verse today. Uh, it's probably a verse that a lot of you have been um, reciting to yourself over the last few weeks. Uh, it's a very, very popular verse, and uh, it says this. It says in verse uh, 28, Romans chapter 8, it says, We know that all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. We know that all things work together for good. So the question this, uh, today is, uh, how does something good come from something bad? Why have, we been, why have we been saying this verse so often? Um, I think the reason we've been saying it is is because in the middle of a very difficult uh, situation, it's, it's been a, a kind of a crazy couple of weeks and really months now, um, we remind ourselves that God is going to somehow work this out for good. I think to understand this a little bit more, we should back up a few verses and start at verse 26. And so if you have your Bibles, look there, it says this, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray uh, for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints 
according to the will of God. So one of the blessings of being uh, a Christian is that the Holy Spirit uh, dwells inside of us. And not only does the Holy Spirit provide comfort for us, um, but the Spirit also provides a conscience for us. That's how we know the difference between right and wrong. But here, Paul writes about that the Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf before God the Father. So this is really, really helpful in times of pain or suffering. And the, the, what it says there is that uh, when we are in a time of weakness. So it doesn't say if we're in a time of weakness. Um, and it really, the language there isn't saying that there will just be one time of weakness. It's saying in our weakness, meaning probably every day we're going to be experiencing some form of weakness. But it's the Spirit of God who in us and through us is able to give us strength. And one of the ways that we get strength in our weakness is knowing that the Spirit of God intercedes on our behalf. So what does that mean? So think of it this way. All of us have been sick at some point. Uh, sadly, some people are fighting the coronavirus right now. Uh, but many more, actually, are fighting just kind of what we would call regular sicknesses and, and illnesses. So if you've ever been really sick, uh, you know the last thing you're looking to do is have a conversation with somebody. You're not looking to talk. You're not looking to entertain. You don't want to have visitors over. Uh, you're in bed, and all you're thinking of is, God, please take this sickness away. I just don't want to feel this anymore. Make it stop. If you are a parent and you've ever taken uh, a child, especially a young child, to the doctor or to the hospital when they're sick, especially when they're young, they can't even articulate what they're feeling. They can't actually say it. And what can be really frustrating is, is if you know something's wrong, but maybe they can't even talk yet. And so you're trying to figure out what is this infant or toddler feeling? Where's this pain coming from? And it's really hard to know that, which is why a good doctor will say to the mom or the dad, you know this child the best. What do you think is wrong with this child? Uh, what part of the child hurts or causes discomfort? And then they kind of go from there. When we are going through not just a physical illness, but when we are going through a time of weakness, it's the same thing. We don't even know what to say. We're kind of like that little infant. We just feel pain. We, we feel this discomfort and we just cry. Now I'm not a real, um, I'm not a great expert at prayer. Um, I, I'm not uh, better than any of you at this. And in fact, I find myself frustrated with prayer many times, especially during difficult times. I'm almost embarrassed to say that sometimes I don't even know what to say. I know to go to God, but then once I'm there, it's, I'm not sure what to say to God. And this is one of the blessings of the Holy Spirit, is that the Spirit of God knows our hearts. And it says right here that the Spirit will make intercession for us with groanings which can't even be uttered. So when I can't put my thoughts into words, but I sure want God to intervene, uh, I have hope, and you can have hope, that the Holy Spirit is taking these feelings, these groanings, and sharing those with God the Father. That's a great benefit of our faith. But these prayers now lead to the promise that we see in verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. So think about the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. Remember Joseph, uh, it started out where it seems like he came from a really good situation, a great family, a big family, lots of brothers, but there was some jealousy there. He was uh, looked at it as brothers by being the favorite son of their father. And so they took him out, and you probably know the story. They, they beat him up, they abused him, um, they ridiculed him, they threw him in a well, and then they ended up selling him to slave traders. The slave traders then go to Egypt, and he finds himself in a foreign uh, country 
at the bottom of the barrel as someone with no rights. He's merely a piece of property. He's a slave. How is it that something good could have come from that? How can good come from abuse, um, jealousy, being taken advantage of, slavery, uh, being in a place where you don't know anybody, it's a completely different culture, having no rights, how can any of that be good? And the answer is, none of those things are good themselves. But what's good is what comes out of that. So you know the rest of the story. Uh, even though he starts as a slave, Joseph works his way up the ladder and eventually is second in command of the entire nation. Meanwhile, back where his brothers and his father live, they go through this horrible famine. There's no food left. And where do they go for food? They go to Egypt to Pharaoh, who has these huge storehouses filled with excess food. When they get there, who's the very person that they stand in front of to make a request for this food? It ends up being their brother, Joseph. I heard another interesting example just this week of um, something that is bad producing something good. Uh, you, you've probably heard that uh, last year, especially in the second half of 2019, uh, that China was really clamping down on churches and they were forcing uh, many churches to close, especially some of the big Christian churches. And as a result, some of these bigger churches were forced to meet in smaller venues, like in houses. Uh, some of them even met in what we call underground churches, secret churches that met in private. I wonder if back then we would have ever known that something which seemed to be bad a church being told they could no longer meet and worship together, I wonder if we would have ever imagined back then that maybe some of those believers were spared from this virus because they were not allowed to be in large groups. Instead, they were meeting in small, uh, hidden groups. I think it's a good example of where God takes uh, a bad situation and produces something good from it. But not all things are good. So don't misunderstand me. Um, don't, don't send me an email this week and say, are you saying that COVID-19 is good? Not at all. Not, there are many things which are bad. And we are not told that we are to enjoy those things. Uh, we're not told that those things are fun, that they can even be celebrated. But rather that God takes all things and works those things into something which is good. So no, no matter how bad something may be, God can take that bad thing and use it for something good. So what is God trying to do with us? What is God trying to do with you? Is there something through this pandemic, is there something through this time of great uncertainty is there something that God is trying to do in you as one of his children in order to produce something good once this is over? So what's the big picture? You know, last week we celebrated Easter and the resurrection of Christ. If you keep reading in Matthew 28, we just read a few verses last week, but at the end of the chapter, Christ gives what we often call the Great Commission. And this is what he says. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. And so Christ says, uh, this is the main point this is the big deal. This is what the church is all about going forward, making disciples. And so I think, in light of this verse in Romans, that God is using all things to create good. I think it would be wise for us to remember, what's the big goal? What's the big point? And God's goal is for people to be made into disciples. And so God is always at work 
through difficult situations doing two things. He's always using difficult situations to first save people, and then for people who are already saved, he's using those situations to make them holy. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 1, he said, He, God, chose us before the foundations of the world to be holy and without blame before him. He later writes in Colossians chapter 1, he says this, he says uh, that we are being presented as holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. And so what is God trying to do? He's trying to make something good out of something bad, and we know that he can and does use difficult situations to accomplish his purpose. So how is God using COVID-19? How is he using this coronavirus in order to bring good things about? Well, I've got two ways that I can think of. I know there's more, but the first is this way. Uh, people are being drawn to Christ through this difficult time. People who otherwise may not have cared about God, they may not have cared about the, the Bible, they may not care about Jesus Christ, are suddenly sensitive to things of a spiritual nature because they're realizing how frail they are. I read uh, the other day the latest count of how many jobs have been lost, how many people have been affected, and just the ripple effects that come uh, with those numbers. Who would have known two or three months ago that we would have millions and millions of people out of work, millions and millions of students out of school? None of us would have ever known this. And suddenly we're aware of how fragile our lives really are. Solomon said that God places eternity in the hearts of men. There's a hole in our hearts that's God-shaped. And we may try to fill it with other things, but when things get serious, there's something in us that knows this is the God-shaped hole that can only be filled by Him. And so when people are hurting, what do they do? They oftentimes turn to God. And so I think we can say with complete confidence, because of this virus, because of this pandemic, because of all the ripple effects, people will be saved. God is working the bad things out in order to accomplish his good. Here's another example. Because of this pandemic, people are being reconciled to each other. You know, Solomon, uh, he wrote another verse. You may not know this verse, but he said, it's better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting. So maybe in our language, we would say this. It's better to go to a funeral than to a wedding. Well, why in the world would, would that make any sense? Why is it better to go to something which is sad versus something which is happy? So it's not saying that the wedding or a happy celebration isn't good. It's, it's saying better to go to the place of mourning than the place of feasting. I think here's why. When we go to the place of mourning, we are much more aware of things which matter. We're thinking about life and death. We're thinking about really hard questions. We're thinking of things of eternal significance. When we go to a celebration, we love it, we're having a great time, but usually we're thinking, what kind of food are we gonna have when this is all over? So think about this, have you ever been part of making a guest list for a wedding or for a birthday party or graduation party? And it's common, we may not want to admit it, but when we make these guest lists, a lot of times we pick and choose and we say, I definitely want this person here, uh, but I don't know if I want this person. It's, they're always kind of a little tense and they, if they come, they may start something or get into an argument. And so I, I don't want them there. But have you noticed that we really never put together guest list for funerals? Rather for a funeral service, we usually just share this is the time that it's gonna happen. And for the most part, Anyone is welcome to attend uh, and to pay their respects. Why is that? I think it's because during a time of mourning, 
we find ourselves extra gracious, even to those we may not be getting along with, even to those that we may have tension with. And you've probably experienced this, I know I have, that you can actually find yourself uh, being reconciled with someone, fixing a relationship with someone during a time of otherwise great difficulty. Maybe in a hospital waiting room, maybe at a funeral home, maybe at someone's bedside. But it's possible, and it happens actually quite often, that we are reconciled with each other during times of pain and suffering. I say all that to say this, that's proof that God is working all things together for good. So I don't know about you and your family, uh, we've never been really that much into doing puzzles. Um, nothing against them, but we just don't do a lot of puzzles at our house. When the kids were little, we had those puzzles that had like four or six pieces in them. I mean, the puzzle was this big, but there were only four pieces, four corners. And, and we would help them to do it, and we would cheer them on when they finished it. But we stopped cheering them on once they were like 14 or 15, because they, they were pretty good at it by then. But when we saw that this quarantine was gonna happen and a stay-at-home order was getting ready to be issued and we, we realized we were gonna be at, at the house for a while, we said, we better find some things to do. So I grabbed a couple kids, we went to a store looking for a puzzle. There was one puzzle left and uh, we bought it. And we set up a table and chairs and wouldn't you know it, we actually ended up liking doing the puzzle. And so now for the last five or six weeks, whatever it's been, we've had a puzzle uh, in the corner of our living room. And, you know, we kind of work on it every day a little bit. And it's, it's, it's provided some entertainment for us. But someone, um, actually a friend from church, they gave us this puzzle a couple weeks ago. And we opened it up and we separated all the edges from the middle pieces and um, started working on it. And then I realized that no one touched this puzzle for like a week. It was just sitting on the puzzle table and nobody was touching it. And so I went over there one day and I sat down and um, I looked at the piece and I know you can't totally see this piece, but I, I look at this piece and it says on the box that this is a foil finish. It's this metallic shiny finish on it that each piece, you can't even see what's on it. And after a few minutes at the table, I realized, no wonder the kids aren't working on this puzzle. This thing is sheer misery. This is horrible. This is the worst way to spend a day in quarantine. And I just, I couldn't get any pieces to match. It was super frustrating. And so I just took all the edges apart. I dump it back in the box and I said, so we're never doing that puzzle again. So that, that puzzle is a little bit like kind of what's happening right now. I'm sure you've found yourself at moments in the last few weeks where you may have a situation which is super frustrating. You may have just a, an isolated incident or you may have a conversation or you may have something that's a result of school or work or something which is just, it's frustrating and, and you can't do it or it doesn't make sense or you look at it and it just kind of makes you mad. I wanna encourage you, let's not do with our lives what I did with this puzzle. In the middle of being super frustrated, I threw everything back into this box. And um, what I never got to experience, and the rest of my family didn't get to experience because I stopped it, was we never got to see the finished product. So I know you won't be able to see it totally, but here's the picture. If we had kept going, we would have seen this puzzle. It's a picture of this beautiful outdoor market with all sorts of fruits and vegetables. But all I could see was this super frustrating piece that in and of itself made no sense whatsoever. This is a difficult time. And sometimes we just see the one little piece. And that little piece can be confusing. It can be frustrating. It can be maddening. And it just makes us doubt everything and say, how could this little thing ever lead to anything good? I believe that not only 
during this pandemic, but certainly after this pandemic, we'll be able to, with the benefit of time, stand back and look at these few months and see that God indeed was doing just what he promised, that he is working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. There are a lot of bad things, a lot of frustrating things, but God is in the process of making us holy, making us like him, or maybe even for you today, he may even be drawing you to himself to become a Christian as a result of these difficult times. Let me pray for us and then we'll be done. God, I pray that you will take each individual piece of this pandemic, each frustrating experience. Uh, students are, their, their school years are being turned upside down, sporting events are uh, being canceled, graduations are being postponed, uh, people are out of work or uh, working fewer hours. Sadly, uh, now we know some are getting sick and are dealing with this virus. And so we know that up close, many of these pieces are very painful and they make no sense. We just want them to stop. Uh, but we can hopefully trust you. I would ask that you give us the faith to trust in you, that you will take all these broken pieces that may not make much sense on their own, and as you put them together, uh, we will see a beautiful picture. And so thank you that you promise that you will use everything for our good and for your glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'll see you next week. All right, let's close our service with one more song. And as we go into the week, let's go filled with the living hope that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have a great Sunday. One, two, three, four. <laughs>
Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning, then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. Thank you for watching another online presentation from New England Bible Church. It is our prayer that the living hope of Jesus Christ is ministering to you today. One of the primary ways that the Lord meets his people is through his word. Regardless of circumstances, we have the opportunity to turn to the Bible to see what he has for us today and what he has for us tomorrow, and most importantly, what he's already done for us through the cross. We would invite you to check out the connections questions. You can find a link to them underneath this video. There, there is a series of questions and answers that you can go through by yourself, in your home, or with others utilizing safe social distancing practices. Also below this video, you'll find a link to our online giving portal, as well as some information about youth group activities. We continue to pray for you and look forward to a time when we can be worshiping again together. God bless.